Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by NQA. Uh, my name's Richard Walsh, and joining me this afternoon, or it's certainly this afternoon where we are, uh, is Terry Fisher, who uh, looks after uh, our health and safety within, within NQA. Um, so just to make sure that you're all in the right place, um, you should see on the screen benefits of integrating your management systems. If that's what you're expecting, you're in the right place. If you're expecting something else, then you've possibly uh, tuned into the wrong webinar. <coughs> So, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Just good afternoon, sorry to Terry. Yes. There. So, yeah. thank you. A couple of people. We've already got a good evening from Cyprus. Good evening. Uh, obviously, people in different parts of the world. So, I appreciate that not everybody's sat in the UK. So, good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. Wherever you might be. Uh, and as I say, welcome. Benefits of integrating your management system. Um, so, we are NQA. We are one of the top three within the UK certification bodies. Uh, and looking at the slide that you can see there, uh, we have a worldwide presence covering uh, a wide number of standards uh, across across the UK. Uh, and in a couple of areas, we are we are the number one in America with a number one certification body, for instance, in the aerospace sector. Uh, and globally, we are the number one certification body in telecommunications and automotive. So a little bit about um, NQA and who we are. Uh, and just a little bit of a slide there to show uh, some of the things about us. And we've been around as a certification body for, for over 30 years. It's actually 32 years now. Uh, we, we're, we've been offering certification, starting out doing quality certification. Uh, NQA now doesn't stand for anything. Uh, we used to be called National Quality Assurance, which is where the initials NQA came from, and we started out offering 9,001 certification. And over the years, we've gradually expanded to cover more and more certification systems, those uh, management systems, hence the, uh, the reason maybe for covering, integrating those systems, because we now cover many, many of them. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, I, do we have an office in Cyprus too? Um, we certainly have a representative in Cyprus, yes, uh, we do. Uh, we tend to have agents around the world and yes, uh, in answer to the question, do we have an office in Cyprus? Yes, we do have people based in Cyprus that can work with us. Good afternoon, Mike. Uh, Mike's in South Africa. Uh, so uh, seeing a few people. Now, um, one of the things that I just wanted to, to point out um, and everybody's grasping this. Most people at the moment are typing things into the question box. We tend to use the chat function rather than the question box. So can I ask a favor? Those of you that have started uh, typing things into the bit that says uh, questions, um, we tend on the webinars to use the chat function rather than the question function. Uh, I think it operates just the same. Uh, um, so one of the things I wanted to just um, point out right from the start, and maybe some of you sat, sat through some of my other webinars, my areas of expertise are energy and environment in particular, both Terry and I also cover quality. I A lot of my webinars tend to be very, very heavy on slides. I can assure you, that this is, um, now that's interesting, somebody's saying they don't have audio. I'm guessing everybody else can hear, so it's pointless me talking to this chap because he's not gonna be able to hear what I'm saying. But uh, Terry, can you answer that question to, uh, that's been nice. asked on the quest box? Um, somebody's saying I, have, I, I don't have audio, is there sound yet? Uh, it's clearly a problem at his end, not at our end, because I'm guessing everybody else can hear is okay. Um, so yeah, um, this this presentation is not going to be particularly massively heavy on slides. One of the reasons for two of us being involved is so that we can chat to each other, we can bounce things off, and we can have a conversation in effect that you can listen into. But one of the things that are oh, right, some people are not seeing a chat box, so we'll stick with the question box. We'll we'll monitor both. If you've got a chat box, use a chat box. If you haven't got a chat box, use a question box. We can see both of them. We'll pick them up. We'll pick them up either way. It doesn't really matter. One of the things I want to encourage you though is to ask questions, 
because a lot of this is about people asking us questions and us providing some some feedback some thoughts some answers and obviously we'll read those questions out because uh, we, we're not going to be allowing other people to speak but we'll read a question out and we will then um, sort of have a discussion Terry and I about uh, about maybe the points that to raise so don't wait till the very very end right is integration the same as PAS 99 uh, we're going to cover that uh, so yes uh, it is basically uh, we'll, we'll we'll get on to that as part of the slides so presumably we're all okay with the housekeeping don't need to take copious notes we are going to send out to everybody who's registered you will get a copy of the slides so PDF copy of the slides will be sent out this webinar is also being recorded and there will be a link in the email that you get that sends out the uh, the slides there will be a link to the recording which will be placed on YouTube we have a YouTube channel NQA and you can access not only this but you can access any other of our past webinars so uh, feel free to browse through that uh, you'll find some of mine you'll find some of Terry's and you'll find some some other webinars as well that we've done on a whole range of subjects but today we're going to be concentrating on integrating management systems uh, and why why we might be covering so so there we go so we're going to be looking at uh, Annex SL and PAS 99 as to what those two things are some of you may already know some of you may not I see a few questions coming in already that's good I'm not seeing anything in the chat box which is fine uh, oh right here we go we've got quite a loud oh here we go loud loud and clear in sunny Essex well it's sunny where I am as well we're both Terry and I are in Yorkshire you can probably tell from our accents we're both in uh, in Yorkshire um, but it's sunny where we are as well um, so um, Annex SL PAS 99 we're going to look at the, the different combinations of standards that we can have we're going to you know we, we, you can sort of combine any of the standards and I'll look at why that's possible we're going to look at why you should integrate what are the benefits of integration as part of that we'll also look at some of the uh, stumbling blocks uh, that might be placed in people's way some of the things that might act as barriers that people might wonder about uh, as to what integration what problems integration might call I've got uh, a, a, a little analogy that I like to use on how to think of integration uh, an interesting way of thinking it I used to teach integrated management systems many many years ago in another life when I was a consultant and finally then we're going to have a discussion about the common areas and the different areas within within the different standards and, and, and maybe have a think about how some of those standards would actually fit together Oh, sunny in Murfield as well. You're Murfield, you're halfway between where I am. I'm in I'm in Brighouse, uh, and Terry's in uh, in Doncaster. So we're not a million miles away. Uh, whoever whoever that is that's answered that question. So uh, I'll lean out the window and wave to you, Stuart. Okay, <laughs> right. Enough of me chuntering and 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 uh, and chatting about. There we go. We get weather forecasts from everybody now. Right. I think Let's it's fair to say that the majority of the UK is quite sunny and uh, blue okay. sky. So. Yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> so um, we'll settle down. We've had 10 minutes of, uh, of, of me chuntering on and, uh, and being my usual uh, jokey self. So um, so thank you for joining us, all, all of you. Thank you for giving up an hour on this sunny afternoon. Um, I'm guessing most of you are working from home. Some of you may be uh, maybe sat in the office. But anyway, uh, both Terry and I are at home. So. The first thing we said we were going to have a little bit of a look at was was Annex SL. So Annex SL um, was published in 2011 by uh, ISO, and it's it's a high level structure for all ISO management standards. So whether it's 9001, 14001. Uh, the new 45,001 for health and safety, 50,001, all of the new standards, and obviously the new 50,001, uh, we're still in the transition period as, as we are with 45, but the, all of these new standards as they're published are all now following the, uh, the layout, the structure of, of Annex SL. Uh, it replaced what was known as Guide 83. Now, I don't really remember working with Guide 83, but Guide 83 did exactly the same thing. And the idea of creating a common, a common structure was to try and streamline all of the standards, to try and make sure 
that they all followed this same this same structure that they weren't going off at tangents and covering different things it was certainly to encourage standardization that was the main reason really to make sure that all of these new standards as they were written and i think the first two that were published were 9001 and 14001 back in 2015 september 2015 they are all now standardized into the same format and we'll look at that format shortly but and of course by encouraging that standardization what it's actually done it has meant that all of these standards are much much easier to integrate together because they all follow the same structure so within the annex sl format i'm sure most of you that are dealing with management systems will recognize that format so there are 10 clauses set out in in annex sl the auditable clauses that we as a certification body would come in and audit are clauses four to ten and when we come on to looking at the uh, the clauses uh, and any areas that share common values and any areas that might be slightly differently uh, then we'll start with clause four going through to clause 10. So they're the auditable clauses. Clause one, two, and three sort of set the scene for the, the relevant standard, explain what the standard's all about. Normative references list other cross references that might be pertinent to the standard, and then a set of terms and definitions that in some cases are common across all standards, and in other cases are relevant to that particular standard. And where possible, and I say that I would strengthen and underline that where possible, the clauses have identical core text, no matter which standards they're being applied to. And in the main, in a lot of those common areas, share common terms and common core definitions. So that's what Annex SL is. Annex SL is the tool that's allowed us really to work together and to, to, to much more easily integrate all of our new standards. So there was a question asked about PAS 99 and, and, and anything that begin, and all the PASs, and there's, 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 there's loads of them. If you don't know, PAS, PAS stands for Publicly Available Specification. Um, and, and PAS 99 has been around 14 years now, uh, and it was set up by BSI in the UK to allow the streamlining of management systems. It was refined and re, uh, reissued in 2012, and I believe that that's still the current version. And again, what it's doing, it's, 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 it's giving a bit of guidance on the common elements of all the standards and a bit more information on how to integrate them because a, a, a PAS standard, uh, is a specification, but it's a specification with guidance. So it's a useful document, and 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 you can you can be certified to the PAS standards, uh, and we certify to various standards. I'm not quite sure of the benefit, the value. Perhaps somebody would like to tell me if if, if they've been certified to PAS 99. Um, but basically, PAS 99. Is, 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 is guidance and the specification on how best to, to pull everything together so that it is all in this Annex SL format. And, and again, it highlights the common elements, how to integrate them to make sure that they meet all the standards requirements. But with PAS 99, it suggests you have just have one set of policies, one set of procedures, uh, and, that, and that actually when you're carrying out auditing, you're auditing more than one system at a time. Uh, and you can see the other things in the slides there. Improves overall efficiency, there's, uh, removes the duplication of tasks, sets up clearly defined roles and responsibilities across all the different standards, highlights where there are common objectives, and ultimately makes it easy to continually improve all of your individual management systems that you've again brought together. So that's what PAS 99 is doing. Uh, it's sort of a way of, of helping you make sure that everything is brought together into that Annex SL format. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just gloss over this pretty quickly. These are some popular combinations of the different standards that we actually see as we're auditing. Uh, nine and 14, so that's quality and environment, nine and 45. Obviously not in there is 18,001 because you could, um, you could, you could actually, um, integrate uh, OSAS 2018, but obviously that's been overtaken now by ISO 45001. What we are starting to see, uh, and I think Terry might uh, confirm this, I'm certainly seeing it with ISO 50001, 
as people are then transitioning or migrating in the case of 45,000 to the newer standards, it suddenly becomes easier to go for that full integration. So we're now starting to see a greater uptake of integration as people get themselves certified to all of the current versions of, 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 of these standards. Okay. Yeah, that's, can I just step yeah, in there? That's certainly the case uh, within within the UK, whereby um, organisations may well have had nine and fourteen and not formally uh, had a OHS management standard, but they're certainly using the Annex SL framework as an opportunity to have a combined management system, an integrated management system across within their organisation. And there is a question there. We just received a question earlier about um, about integration and how they're audited and whether it's a single certification or whatever. Basically, an integrated management system um, can be certified as an integrated management system and it will still stay all the coverage of the three standards or two standards or whatever it is that however many standards are integrated and how they then are certif certificated will depend on the client and the client's requirements, how the how the business is structured, etc. So yes, they can be integrated. They can be you can get a single uh, certification certificate and or you could have individual certification certificates depending on what you as a, a client needs. There you go. Yes. OK, so those are the some of the popular combinations that we see. Uh, and there was also questions uh, there was a question, can you, where does 27,001 fit in? You can, in, yes, you can integrate any of the standards, any of these management standards, whether you will, you know, there's, there's, there's 22,001. In fact, tell you what, if I move the slide on, uh, just a second, for some reason, there we go. So not only the standards on that previous slide, but any of the standards on there, 50,001, 27,001, 22,000, which is food safety, medical devices, uh, risk management, there's uh, there's automotive standards, there's aerospace standards. They can all be integrated together because they all share this, this common structure. So there, there, isn't, there isn't a right and a wrong answer, really. Well, the right answer is you can integrate any standard with any other um, and, and, and have it audited. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it does cause some 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 slight issues for, from our perspective when we have to make sure that an audit team has the experience to cover all of the different standards that are being audited, but that's not a problem. Um, th there is a good question just being asked, and I, I've had this with a couple of my clients. Um, it, and it's, for example, a company is certified to 45,001 by NQA, and 9,001 by a company I won't mention because I'm not promoting anybody else's certification body. So they've got <laughs> so they've got 45,001 certified by NQA and 9,001 by somebody else. Now I have that also. I have clients that have 50,001 with us, uh, and the reason they have that is historic because actually, and I'm going to uh, I'm going I'm going I'm going to uh, Drag a little bit now. NQA were the world's first certification body to be accredited to to, to offer fifty thousand and one. We were the first in the world, so therefore we sort of stole the market a little bit, and we had a number of clients that came to us for fifty thousand and one, but had their other three standards or other two standards with with other CBs, and and that has stayed. And I still audit fifty thousand and one as part of a fully integrated management system. The only problem that you do occasionally see with that in answer to this question is, and this shouldn't happen because at the end of the day we're all assessing to the same standards, is maybe where one certification body has a slightly different take on how one of the common areas of the integrated standard is being operated. So I might think that I like the way that the uh, integrated audit program has been put together, but another auditor from another certification body might prefer it to be done slightly differently. Now, that shouldn't really matter because at the end of the day, the auditor's preferences are not there. That's not what it's all about. So long as what I'm seeing complies with the requirements of all the relevant standards, then it shouldn't make a difference. But that's the only danger in answer to that question 
if 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 you've got two certification bodies covering two parts of the standard is making sure that the common areas that you've not got a battle going on between the two certification bodies and if that happens something's gone wrong really because uh it, it shouldn't happen right uh okay i'm just going to move on uh, so those are some of the other new standards the point i'm making is that there are new standards coming along all the time all of these new standards are written in such a way that they can be easily integrated with any other and it doesn't have to be nine you you, you could integrate food safety and medical devices should should you wish if if those were both relevant if you're producing food and producing uh, i don't know um ventilators topical thing at the moment um you might you might have decided to turn over your sandwich making business into producing ventilators um you, you, you could be certified to them both and it doesn't matter there's no right and wrong way of, of what you can and can't integrate you can integrate any of these standards together because they all share this common structure so so let's have a look at why we might like to integrate why should we actually thinking be thinking about integrating so so how many and when we say company managers we, we, we're talking about sort of top management leadership within businesses now how many how many businesses how many senior managers within businesses would like to better utilize their resources resources are always expensive people are an expensive resource how many would like less bureaucracy i suspect a lot of them would how many would like all areas of the organization aligned, everybody pulling in the same direction and having a, a one set of company-wide objectives? I'm sure everybody wants to improve and make things more efficient, more effective. Pull the organization together, everybody working as a team, not people working in silos and everybody working in their own little areas. Try and get rid of delays and backlogs. Make sure that everybody has clearly defined roles, responsibilities and authorities some clarity in the processes of the organization again everybody understands they know what they're doing an ease an easing of management makes life easier uh, makes oversight is much simpler ways of identifying and prioritizing improvements and ultimately less infighting and barriers like you know, silo working between departments and i'm sure and i don't know whether any of you sitting in on this are senior managers within businesses but i'm sure if you are I would be very surprised if there was anything on that slide that you wouldn't say yes to. I'm sure we all want our businesses to run in that way. Equally well, how many people who work for businesses, how many employees want less frustration, less paperwork to have to manage, a better understanding of what they do and how it fits into the bigger picture, feel part of a team. Again, knowing what they're responsible for, clearly defined roles, responsibilities and authorities, and not to have to make the same mistakes over and over again. So, so if managers and employees want the same thing, why, why not, why do we not support the development and implementation of integrated management? Surely if everybody wants all of those things, that's what we should be doing now one of the things that we've we've we come across and this is this is a slide that terry terry put in there are a number of common perceptions so these are the perhaps some of the arguments that people might throw at us uh, as to why we shouldn't i don't know whether anybody's ever said any of these to you terry um yeah I've, they have I've heard this said yes yeah um hence why i use know, the phrase perceptions not absolutely. not you know uh, facts yeah it's 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 people's feelings people's thoughts people's comments you know the system's going to become too large to manage effectively are we going to end up creating a monstrosity you know if we silo things you know the, the opposite to integration is that everything's run separately and you've got thread down the corridor that looks after environment and you've got bill down the end of the road that, 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 that oversees health and safety and they all beaver away and they all do things separately we could understand that if if we pull everything together we're going to be creating this huge monstrosity that's gonna that's going to take over everything and we can't manage it is integration going to create more risk of losing registration is that going to happen could could it cause could it cause us to lose what we've already got we're comfortable with what we've got do we want to make these changes do we want to put things at risk and risk integrating and getting it wrong probably the key perception is it going to dilute the effectiveness 
and 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 possibly not even just effectiveness maybe even the uh, perception the um you know are, 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 are you gonna is, is, is health and safety just gonna get lost for instance in this whole maelstrom of of lots and lots of other areas of the system so is it going to dilute the effectiveness of something is it going to give something sort of less of a priority and and does integration have to include everything do we have to have combined policies do we have to have combined procedures and are we going to have to sit down and have to rewrite everything from scratch these are all the sorts of things that people people throw at us people say to us oh i don't want to do it like that i'm not sure i can be bothered it's gonna it's gonna cause me a huge amount of work i'm gonna to have to sit down and rewrite everything from scratch or i've just got everybody up to speed on health and safety they all know what they're doing i don't want to take it i don't want to people to think i'm putting it on a back burner that sort of thing so those are some of the common conceptions so basically what i'm saying is it seems to me and it seems to us at nqa that developing an integrated management system is probably common sense but as we see in life in general the problem with common sense is it's not very common so before we move on I'd like to just plow through some of these questions and maybe just have a look at some of the points that people are raising maybe some of the things uh, some of the questions that people are asking um and, and and see if we can deflect some of those uh viewpoints is there anything you want to pick on terry no not in particular there was one about cost um um people talk about integration will it you know it's one of the things to that can help justify an integrated management approach is if it will actually save some money directly I think there's two viewpoints there is a there is a potential for it to reduce your assessment costs because as we integrate management systems we can because of that commonality and the various elements there we can reduce the assessment time by a, up to a maximum of 20 percent currently according to UCAS uh, current guidelines so therefore that has a direct impact on the assessment costs for your organization yeah, if, but if I you think, think about so go on, i think more importantly there it's not about the cost necessarily directly for the assessment process if you think from an efficiency part of view within the organization i would i would presume that the cost of the assessment will be relatively small in in significance compared to the duplication and the replication of work etc throughout the organization itself so i think the cost side of it is yes it's the some assessment reductions potential but it's more important that the business works effectively because the cost yeah. benefit then is, is considerable so you think if, you, if we take an example and we're going to come on to these towards the end but i'll pick i'll pluck one out now if you were to take something like management review if you've got three systems let's say you've got nine thousand and one fourteen thousand and one and forty five thousand and one if you've got them all set up as three completely separate systems you're gonna to have to have three management reviews why not integrate them have one management review that will cover all of the common areas and then we'll break off of the maybe a section on health and safety then a section on quality and a section on on environment so it, it makes life and, and that's that's as we'll see later on in the presentation there's a lot of areas within all of these standards where there are common areas and you don't need to cover them three times if you've got three systems if you've got one integrated system you only need to cover them once so and, and that's why auditing from our perspective is also easier because we're not coming in and having to cover three management reviews we can cover a management review that's why we are allowed as Trevor as, as, as Terry says we also uh, are allowed to reduce our auditing time but, but Terry's right the, our external costs what you're paying us per day is probably not the most uh, the biggest cost saving the biggest cost saving will be in time so anything else um, Oh, right, somebody's put only if you're certified by the same body, otherwise the costs will be double. I won't say the cost will be double. If you've got, as, as we were saying earlier, if you've got two different certification bodies, there will be some overlap and there won't be a saving in the certification process because you, you're right, you're going to have to pay for NQA to, 
to, to cover bits and we're going to want to see the common bits you're then going to have to pay for i'll say bsi to then come in and audit and they're going to want to look at those common bits as well you will still make quite considerable savings in the time yourself but you, you're right there won't be the same savings in the external certification costs um in an integrated there's another question in an integrated system eg 14 and 45 the auditor finds no major non-conformances for 14 but five major non-conformances for 45 would you lose your integrated certification so is it better in this case to be certified to 14 and 45 no i'm no. i'm not so sure right so Go on, Terry, you yeah. answer that one. Can I, right, so for, in, ter in terms of, of this, if there were, let's, in that scenario, if there was uh, several major non-conformances against a particular discipline of the standard, it doesn't matter how they're registered, potentially, because at the end of the day, the organisation has still got to go through the corrective action process and the investigation process, etc., to address those concerns, regardless whether it be... A, a single certificate or an integrated certificate so the process of correcting that and doing it still needs to be done and as long as that was done effectively then there's no reason why any element of the uh, certification would be suspended if it failed to be addressed then as with any as with any standard then that element could be suspended or withdrawn because you haven't complied with the requirements but you would that... you would all, you would only lose your certification Re having a major non-conformance raised against an element of a standard doesn't mean you lose your certification you only lose your certification if you don't do anything about it within the yeah. set period of time so i would argue that if you take taking your management system seriously and you're taking your certification visit seriously that should be a situation that never occurs in in all my years of auditing i've been at nqa for 13 years now i think i've only ever had one in one incident throughout 13 years where we've had to it's certainly with any of my clients where we've had to suspend somebody's certification because they haven't managed to address a non-conformance in time in a couple of occasions where maybe they've required a little bit of extra time then they've come back to me and said look we're not really gonna we're gonna struggle to get this done in three months can can we have an extra month and and i would always uh listen to what they say and then make a judgment but usually the judgment would be yes uh, so long as people are engaging with us. So very, very rarely would we ever have to uh, to lose anybody's certification. But no, if if you got to that stage, if if there was a, a something in an environment, say, where where it, it didn't get closed, that you would only lose that relevant part of the certification, providing that non-conformance applied only to environment. If it was a major non-conformance in a common area, you might find that there's there's a problem so for instance if we came in and you hadn't done any internal auditing auditing across any of the standards then yes that might be more of a problem uh let's have a look at any other questions uh let's see what we've got um because some of them now are relating to to individual clauses so we'll come back to the individual clauses um so how easy would be integration be for five standards Fair, five, six, seven, many as you like. Um, you, you can integrate as many standards as you like. And I'll, we'll perhaps come back to that when we look at the common areas and the areas that differ. And maybe that will answer that question. Uh, could integration reduce the UCAS required number of days? Absolutely, yes, it would. And that was the point that Terry was making. That that when we, when we work out number of days for an audit, uh, the spreadsheet that we put all the information in allows for some integration and that integration reduces by up to 20 percent so so that's the point Stuart that, that, that Terry was making about uh, what UCAS have to oversee us carrying out and uh, and yes it, it would reduce the audit time right I think I'm probably going to move on at that point um, because I think a lot of the other questions that we're starting to get 
uh, tend to reply, tend to relate rather to to some of the common areas and the separate areas. So so we'll uh, we'll, we'll push on because we've been going 35 minutes now. So uh, let's just see why is that not moved on. There we go. So what does integration do? So, so it enables an organization's overall missions and objectives to be achieved. In a lot of cases where I work with integrated systems, we tend not to, they tend not to be called an integrated management system anymore. I, I start to get a little bit confused because people mention them as IMS. Now, to us now, IMS can mean two things. It can mean integrated management system, and it can mean information management system, which would be 27,001. So, so I tend to prefer now to think of an integrated system as a fully combined business management system, a system that will manage all facets of your, your business, whether it's the quality of what you produce, how you produce it environmentally, the health and safety of your employees, uh, how you're using energy, etc., uh, etc. Et so I prefer to think of it as, a, as a, a, a fully combined business management system that helps the organisation's overall mission and, and business objectives to be achieved. It pulls together all of the different processes and different interfaces, because as, as we know within any business, if we're going to find problems in any, in, in, in any areas, it tends to be where we've got interfaces between two different facets of the business and how the, biz, how, how the different silos, if that's how we're working, integrate with each other. So it, it tries to break down all of those barriers and defines all the processes and make sure that all the relevant areas of a process are covered. So. It, you know, if you're looking at a particular process in manufacturing, it would make sure that not only have you covered quality in there, but you've covered how things happen environmentally, that it's being done safely, and that, for instance, you're, you're not uh, how you're handling maybe the waste and the resources from that from that particular process. It makes sure that there are clear and accountabilities, responsibilities, and accountabilities across all the different sections. Not that. Here's a document that's got your environmental responsibilities. Here's another document that's got your quality responsibilities. Here's another document that's got your health and safety responsibilities or environment or whatever. Everything's all there and everything's clear and all the different accountabilities are, are assigned. It enables all of the different facets of a process, all the different people integrating in a process, everything to be aligned and working to achieve the same goal. Again, it ensures it works alongside quality, but it's expanding into include the other areas to ensure consistency of our outputs within the business. One of the things that we find more than anything is it controls the spurious generation of documents. One of the worries a lot of people have is integrated management systems are going to just generate more and more and more documentation. Well, they shouldn't. And basically what it should do is bring the generation of documentation within a business into a central function so therefore that we've not got different people producing similar types of documentation it tries to bring together the the production you know clause seven within the standard which looks at documentation brings it all together so that everything is being brought out in a strategic manner of course integration forms the basis for training uh, again, when we're training, we're not training somebody up on a role. Maybe, well, we, we're going to train you on the environmental aspects today. We're going to train you on the health and safety aspects tomorrow. We're going to train you on quality the day after. It brings it all together. It also provides senior management with a tool to assist in their complete oversight. Because obviously, a senior management team, their job is to see the big picture. Their job is to see what's going on across the whole organization. And again, an integrated management system, an integrated management review provides that. It provides that uh, management speak, calls it the helicopter view, provides that sort of overall view uh, of, of, of what's going on. And ultimately, it helps the business identify what areas need improvement, not just in a specific part of the business, but across the entire business so if we're setting out on the role to think about integrating we need to think about the extent to which integration should should occur are we going to fully integrate because that that that's that's the ultimate aim i have a number of clients that are partially integrated and that's not a problem also because one of the things you if, if you look at an nqa report one of the I think on page two one of the questions that we have to fill in as assessors 
is, is the degree of integration, and it's not black and white. There are many, many shades of grey in the middle in terms of integration. Consideration should include the level of competency. Have you got the right level of competency within the business to start to pull all of this together? We need to think about legislative and other requirements. That's a key area, pulling all of those together. But mainly setting out, as you do with any journey, setting out clear objectives. Why are we trying to do this? Why are we trying to pull everything together? What are we setting out to achieve? Because with all of the standards, all of these standards now, all of the new Annex SL-based standards cover in quite detail the processes for managing change. And integrating the system would actually be change that is managed within the system itself. So therefore, we need to make sure that as part of that management of change, that we're setting out clear objectives, we've got a roadmap of what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to get there. And I'm sure you've all seen this. Those of you that are quality gurus will understand this one very much, but you should all do the same. This ultimately is where all of the standards sit. Plan, do, check, act. And every single one of those standards we've talked about, and indeed many, many of the others, all follow that exact same format. Now, this is where I've tried to be a little bit clever now. Um, creative, the, Richard, you're creative. Creative, clever, clever. Yeah, okay, yes, I meant uh, creative sounds better, yes. Um, <laughs> so, how best to think of an integrated management system? Because I've got a background in training, I used to work as a consultant and a trainer. I used to like to come up with analogies. Best, the best way of describing something in a, in a nice, simple structure that everybody can understand. And one of the ways I used to teach people to understand what an integrated management system is, is to think of it as a Christmas tree. So a, a pretty poor, if I'm honest, a pretty sad looking bare Christmas tree. However, what that Christmas tree is, is actually the common areas of Annex SL. So that is the seven auditable clauses of Annex SL. And those seven clauses are common all the way across all of our different management systems that we will have. Now, to avoid getting too complicated with this analogy, I've only picked four. So what we do when we start then thinking about how we're going to integrate, so we make sure we've got the basic structure, we've got all the common areas mapped out, we know what all of those are. We then start to decorate our Christmas tree. So we start to add different colored baubles. So see there's some of the areas now, we're adding the specific quality requirements onto our bare Christmas tree. We then need to think about the environmental areas that we're adding, which are unique to 14,001. We think about the bits that are unique to health and safety, and ultimately we think about, and I've only covered the four main standards that we that we do, energy, I could then start to add all the other ones as well, information management, uh, and so on and so forth. But each of those clauses, sorry, each of those specific standards have got unique areas, and those unique areas are the baubles on the Christmas tree, but they are set out in a way that they are all still a part of the, the structure of, of, of this Christmas tree that guides the way that things are set out. So, now then, why is that not moving on? So that's just a slide I've pinched from one of my other presentations. It was actually from the 50,001 integration standard, but that that is um, basically what we're aiming for. With the integrated management system being core to all of this, and then the other specific standards actually sitting around the edge, all with an element uh, within within the system. So what we're going to do now uh, for the next sort of 15 minutes or so is, is have a bit of a chat, Terry and I, as we go through and look at some of these areas. And what we're trying to do out of the seven clauses that are auditable, I think, and I think Terry's in agreement because we talked about this before we um, uh, before we started this presentation. That there are five clauses that are more or less common, and then there are two clauses where we feel that there are some specific elements. So what we were going to do was spend a little bit of time going through some of these clauses and just talking about how we feel that they may work in an integrated system. So Terry, clause four. 
context and uh, needs of interested parties. Yeah, How there we go. Work? So, I think if you if you're familiar, as we've said, with Annex SL and and any of the uh, aforementioned management systems, you're looking at context. So the context: what does the organisation do? Who does it do it for? Who's interested? What are their interests and how we deliver that? How do we deliver those interests and how do we know that those interests have been delivered effectively? That's the context of the organization. That, in principle, does not change regardless what discipline, discipline has been applied to it in terms of whether it be occupational health and safety, environment or anything else, quality. You still need to understand. So what does the business do? What's the business strategy? What are we thinking about? What are we trying to achieve? And how are we going to go about doing that? And who are we doing it for? Until you understand all that, it can be very difficult to make a clear plan. So this is where the context, it may vary. So as you add disciplines in, environment, obviously, in the UK, we'd talk about the Environment Agency being an interested party. Whereas if you add health and safety in there, we then start to expand that a little bit more and go, yeah, and there's the health and safety executive within the UK. Workers, workers are a key interested party, but you could turn around in environment and say, well, workers are interested in the environment and so are our neighbours and so are our... Yeah. All I'm saying is the principles of context and needs of interested parties are discipline specific to an extent, but the principles of what you're trying to achieve aren't so the the basic framework of the standard still applies yes so they may vary as you add disciplines but the principles of what you're trying to do remain intact and common across the whole of the various disciplines that you're integrating i found that a lot of people by default in their context if they do something like a swot analysis or a pestle analysis which a lot of people seem to use almost by default to crossing the boundaries anyway because if you do a pestle analysis for 14,001 political economic uh social legislative technological you're crossing the boundaries anyway in a lot of those areas so so really i think as you're right terry co context is an area that you can bring everything into that one context document. If it's interesting, the standard doesn't say anywhere that context has to be documented. All context is doing is forming the basis, it's forming the foundations for the thought process that takes you through the rest of the standard. Um, the only slight anomaly, and this 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 is one that uh, there's not a lot winds me up, but occasionally things do. Uh, for those people that have a knowledge of ISO 50001, um, it's the one standard that's gone away from the Annex SL format and doesn't have a separate clause on compliance obligations and the term legal and other requirements appears under interested parties. So occasionally the best laid plans on integrating things come and bite you on the backside and you end up with uh, with something slightly different. So within within clause four, within 50,001, you would need to think about, as you would anyway, uh, the regulator being uh, an interested party, of course, but making sure the legislation's covered. I think clause five on leadership, there's an interesting question come out actually, which I wanted to, to cover at this point, about integrated policies. And I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised at the at, at the point that's been made. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with the point. I'm a little bit surprised, and I think it says more about the customer than it does about the um, the actual company that's got the integrated policies. Um, it was a little, and I'm just trying to find it now because we we've got a number of questions coming through. Basically, it was it was about supplier questionnaires. I've just completed a lot of detailed supplier evaluation questionnaires for aerospace and power stations, and they ask for separate certifications. Now, that's fine. Not a problem with that. But it also asks for integrated, it, it asks for individual statements. So they want to see a quality policy. They want to see an environmental policy. They want to see a health and safety policy, all separate policies. Now, in an integrated system, there is nothing wrong with having shared policies you can have one fully integrated policy so long as that policy makes all the individual commitments so for instance if you read 45,001 it makes there's a there's a particular commitment that has to be made 
50,001 has a slightly separate commitment that has to be made, 14,001 the same. So, so long as the, the integrated policy makes all of the commitments that are required across all of the integrated standards, I personally don't see a problem with that. Would you concur with that, Terry? I would, but I have. A, this is a common issue, to be fair. I've been into quite a, a few organisations that have an integrated management prob, um, system, and they have come across this in regard to their interested parties and customers. The customers re request them to have a separate policy statement. And generally, the, the organisation complies with that because it's a customer requirement and it can be yes. significant and impact on the on the organization so but if it's if it's as far, not as, in, as, far as integration goes there's no reason why you couldn't integrate your policy statement however so, so, if certain so, sectors require you to have an individual certain customers within your and interested parties within your sector require you to have uh, separate policy statements then a lot you, would of treat, you would treat that as a customer requirement, as is a need of an interested party. Yeah. Let so me just it, ask you, it basically depends on that influence, really. Yeah. Let me just ask you a question then, because I don't know the answer to this, uh, and I do, because I don't audit this particular system. Health and safety legislation in the UK requires above a certain size that you have a health and safety policy. Yeah. Would a fully integrated policy that includes 45, would that tick the box? Not that management systems are box ticking exercise, but, but but would that pass muster? Would it meet the requirements? Legally? Would it meet the requirements yes. of the legislation that says that yes. you have to have a health and safety policy if it's yes. part of an integrated policy? Yes, as long as it yes. meets the requirements of 45,001. Absolutely, or yes. Or 18, without yeah. any shadow of a doubt. Because yeah. so there there again, in the legislation, it doesn't, it, it yeah. doesn't fully define... So there you go, Steve. The so, so, so the answer to that would be... Normally, the answer would be yes. We would recommend that you fully integrate. However, if you have specific customers that require you to have individual policies, then then you may have to, to retain those policies separately. And you would treat that as you would any other uh, uh, separate. Uh, let me just, I should have turned my phone off. I do apologize for that. Uh, we that, that should have been, you know, that, that would be maintained as a, as a need of a specific interested party. But, but in terms of leadership, uh, the leadership requirements generally, I think, are the same across all of the standards, that there has to be uh, um, senior management commitment or top management commitment for leadership. Uh, yep. Yes, there's the policies. You have to define roles and responsibilities. And again, there may be, there may be generic roles and responsibilities. There may be specific roles and responsibilities. Again, one or two of the standards say that you have to have slightly different things so for instance iso 50001 mandates the fact that you have to have you have to have an energy management team i don't believe that any of the uh, any of the other standards mandate that that's the case they've all done away i think with having to have a quality manager a health and safety manager an environmental manager yeah and it's deemed to be more of a collective responsibility but 50001 uniquely i believe requires there to be uh, a team in, in in that respect but generally across clause five all of the areas are the same so clause one slight one oh, slight sorry. thing there in in 45001 for example there's an additional requirement in that clause for consultation and participation with workers yes but that's yeah. obviously so there are going to be discipline specific variations but the principles of what the whole uh, title of that particular clause is trying yes. to establish remain constant yeah. under annex obviously itself. i don't i don't i don't know 45 that well does does that participation clause come under leadership or does it come under communication under clause 7 it comes under it's in 5.4 it's in um, it's right, in the okay. leadership yes. because I was the title again for in, in 45 is leadership and worker participation because it's such a key element of course to the management of health yes. and safety responsibility right so work I'm, conscious, yeah. really I'm, I'm conscious we've been going for 55 minutes now so just right. suggesting we maybe push on a little bit that's all yeah. right i'm not gonna cut you off um, no, no. what i would say to everybody is uh if people feel the need to start dropping out after an hour uh we won't take it personally um 
the problem when Terry and I get together is we tend to chat a lot. So uh, and the whole idea of this was very much uh, an interactive type uh, type process. So we will keep on going as long as there are people listening in and people asking questions. So clause six then, risks, opportunities, compliance, obligations, objectives, targets, and associated programs. Yes. So, yes, do you want me to, I'll talk a little bit go, on this. You, go, 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 go that, so, um, most of the businesses I audit, uh, and, and, and I audit some businesses who've got 9, 14, 45, even though I don't audit 45, and we'll take the easy one first, they have one compliance register. So they've got one Excel spreadsheet that covers all of the compliance obligations across the business. What they will tend to have may be, and obviously you can do this in Excel, they may have a generic tab, they may have an environmental tab, a health and safety tab across the bottom, but it's all maintained in one document. And maybe that's a good analogy for an integrated management system, that it's all ultimately in the one, it's under the one umbrella, but there are various sections that are specific to the, to the one area. So, so, so everybody pulls the legal stuff together into one register and jumping ahead slightly to clause nine, which looks at evaluation of compliance, the evaluation of compliance process looks again at all of the different areas. So, so that's a key area where some some complex, where some integration will work very, very well. Risks and opportunities. Now, I always say that risks and opportunities come out of the context of the organisation, because the way I explain context is that all of these standards are all about improving performance. There are things that, that are going to help you achieve that performance improvement. There are things that are going to get in the way. The things that will help you are the opportunities. The things that will get in the way are the risks. And this is all about identifying those risks, identifying those opportunities, maximising the opportunities and mitigating the risks. Now, this is an area where there's a slight bit of divergence, but the principle is exactly the same. So, for instance, health and safety requires that you do health and safety risk assessments. 14,001 requires that you do an aspects and impacts evaluation. Is that not the same as a risk assessment? Just looking at slightly different areas of risk. Within quality, there are risks that you have to think about. What are the risks if we, if our equipment goes out of calibration? What are the risks if we produce something that's wrong? All of the standards, envi energy, energy has an energy, you know, go goes through an energy review. All of these standards have exactly the same process, just with slightly different outcomes. So therefore, again, there is a huge degree of integration in here, or a possibility of integration within the within within a fully integrated system and, and just to confirm there about risks and opportunities so obviously within occupational health and safety you've got the requirement to conduct risk assessments but that doesn't exclude strategic risks and opportunities you know the, the strategic direction of a business we're going to introduce some new plant and some new machinery we're going to do this we're going to do that we're going to change yeah. this change that this is what all encompassing risks and opportunities about the whole of the organization is what is what we're trying to establish yeah. and what are the priorities for that organization hence the linking back to the context absolutely one of the things not to forget and i i do see this and i still i still pick people up on this particularly in say 14,001. i ask about risk and opportunities and the first thing they give me is an aspect register Clearly, from an environmental perspective, there are, there are environmental risks and indeed opportunities that are not related to aspects and impacts. And those are the sorts of things that Terry that Terry's talking about, the more generic business opportunities, the more generic business risks. Uh, just one thing I was just going to catch up on, I was just going to, uh, so somebody needs to leave, so I thank them for, for being in there. Um, no, there was, there, was, there was a note about... Um, about integration and, and and the policies and somebody was asking the question could we have one manual but it's got three policies in it and clearly yes you can and if if you have to have separate policies you could have the one overall business manual that's got three separate manuals contained within it 
how you integrate and how you pull it together and how you document it is entirely up to you. Clause 7, when it talks about documented information, leaves it entirely up to you as a business how you draw all of this together. So in answer to the question, yes, you can. And that would probably be my recommended way forward to get around this having three, four, five different policies. To have them as individual policies, but have them contained maybe as appendices of the same manual. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Clause seven is probably the most common standard. It's, it's, it, this, this comes across every clause, uh, every, every standard rather. Provision of support, provision of resources, making sure people are competent, how we communicate, the availability of documentation, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is the, the easiest element of the system to think about integrating. So a competency matrix. So you look at a particular job. So rather than having a competency matrix for, for the quality aspect and another one for the environmental aspect and another one for health and safety, you could say, this is a particular function within the business. What are the competencies needed? Covering health and safety, so that do, do they need a license to operate a piece of equipment? Do they need to be certified to operate that kit? Do they need to be aware of the quality aspects? Do they need to know what to do with the waste that's been produced? Do they need to know about the energy, how to, uh, et cetera, et cetera? All of that would appear in one integrated competency requirement for that entire function within the business. Most Agreed, definitely. Terry? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's no need to pull them, you know, and as I say, I think clause seven pulls them all together, uh, particularly. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to dive ahead and come back because the next two clauses you might be surprised or not surprised to know are the areas of, of, of the greatest difference, I think, because clause eight is operational planning and controls and emergency preparedness. Now, this is where we now start to shoot off and look at how we actually manage the risks that we've identified and the way we identify, the way we manage those risks is going to be completely different. And, and I always make the point that if you look at ISO, if you look at clause eight in ISO 9001, it runs to about six pages. If you look at clause eight in 14,001, it's half a page. I'm not quite sure where it sits. And, and, and similar in 45. Yeah. I would argue across every other discipline, of all the disciplines, this is what all the management standards are trying to achieve, is effective operational planning and control. That's the core output of what you're trying to, why you're running a management system. So this this is the area where you would have the most documentation that wasn't necessarily integrated. So you might have an operational manual on 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 on, on a forklift truck or something like that, or you may have a checklist for uh, for a Monday morning check on a forklift truck. Now, to be fair, some of that checklist might relate to environmental issues. Yeah, it spills. might. Yeah, it might relate to spills. Is it leaking? Is it dripping oil? How are the hydraulics, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So there is still an opportunity for integration, but generally, a lot of the actual controls coming out, whilst the, uh, as, as Terry says, whilst the objectives are going to be the same, you know, the, the requirements are going to be the same. Ultimately, we're trying to control something. There may be degrees of uh, of different controls for different elements of, of the process within here and certainly emergency preparedness that's a clause I think that only applies in, in ISO 14001 I don't know whether there is a set clause in 45001 there is there is, eight, there eight is, point is there? Two. yeah there certainly the isn't in, yeah there isn't in there isn't in energy, uh, and I don't think there is particularly under that same way. It's it, it's slightly different in in, in quality. Uh, you wouldn't quite have an emergency, but there's lots and lots in there about un, uh, non-conforming product and what you would do if you came across it. So so that's possibly fairly similar. Uh, and again, clause nine, which is all about monitoring, measurement, and analysis. Uh, again, uh, there are some differences in here. But there's also a lot of this almost has a foot in both camps, both slides, really, because I've said that the two key areas for me that, that I think where there's a lot of benefit to be gained from uh, integration is, is in internal audit and management review. You don't need to if you've integrated four different standards, you don't need to have four internal audit um, programs. 
you would have one internal audit program that would audit the common areas and then might be uh, and then an internal audit just relating to have you carried out your health and safety risk assessments or have you carried out uh, environmental uh, checks and things like that but generally those are the areas that would be fully integrated but some of the other areas monitoring measurement uh, again th there is some 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 degrees of difference anything yeah, to add there's, to there's a lot of scope there under monitoring and measurement that can vary isn't it depending on the there discipline, so, on the discipline. <laughs> although there are generic statements the impact and what is actually undertaken because of that can be very discipline specific indeed yes yes indeed right and then the final common area and this is a this is one that i just uh, slightly altered um so this is improvement uh and again this possibly has a foot in both camps so improvement basically uh, is all about when something goes wrong and we raise a non-conformance what do we do about it now again a lot of the standards have slightly different terminology. So, for instance, 45,001 talks about incident investigation. But the process of carrying out that incident investigation is exactly the same as if you had a spill in, in, in say, 14,001, or you suddenly had a big customer complaint that there was a lot of non-conforming product. Um, the process is just the same that you've got short-term corrective action and then it's all about getting to the root cause of what's happened, why it's happened, and then putting things in place to stop it happening again and amending the system if required. So the process is, is more or less the same. It's just that some of the terminology, I believe, is, is slightly different. But the, certainly the starting point and the end point, I believe, are, are the same. Something's happened, we do something about it, we try and stop it happening again. We adjust the system if we need to, uh, and and then we've got to the root cause, and and you know, and it's about making. And then we've got to test the effectiveness of of the corrective action we've put into place. And that principle applies. I have a number of clients that have one non-conformance form, and that form will be filled out whether they found a problem on the shop floor with the quality of a product, whether there's been you know, an oil drum that spilled out in the yard or whether somebody's trapped the finger in a machine. And they would still fill out that same form. You might have to go ahead. So for instance, in, in health and safety, you might also have to go and fill in an accident book. In in environment, you might have to notify the health and uh, you might have to notify the environment agency. But generally the, the document that guides you through that corrective action process is equally applicable to all of the different integrated standards yeah yeah there are variances like you say but the basic principles of, of corrective action investigation improvement remain but they yeah. do link obviously into communication and whatever absolutely absolutely so i think that that really is the end of the presentation as we get to um i just want to quickly now scan through all of these questions and see if there's anything we've missed i think there's one there about non-conformities that needs may need an answer <laughs> right you found that i haven't yet so do you want to do you want to tackle that one terry uh the, well the question is are non-conformances still quality health and safety and environment oh, I yes. Found it now. yes so to to because of these discipline specific requirements it's still quite acceptable to identify non-conformances under their specific discipline. And when we're auditing um, management, integrated management systems, we would still uh, put them against uh, any non-conformances that we found against the standard or the procedural requirements would go against a particular discipline yeah. because there are subtle differences in the clauses as we, as we said throughout. So there's nothing wrong with identifying particular non-conformances against a particular yeah. discipline type. Yeah. But it's also got to bear in mind that you may find a non-conformance against a particular discipline, but when you investigate it, the corrective action could be applied across the whole of the management yeah. system because it could make the whole system better. Remember so, when we audit, 
we're we're doing a sampling basis and we're raising the finding obviously if you're an nqa client but all the all cb should be doing the same when we raise a non-conformance as terry just said we have to say which clause of which standard we're raising it against we might only raise it against the relevant clause that we found but as you say as part of your investigation you might find that this could also apply elsewhere within the business which might impact upon another clause or another standard but we we will tell you in our reports which clause of which standard we're raising it against and i think that's probably the best way of answering answering yeah. that question um we've answered that one on you cass um We've answered that. How easy was it to integrate five standards? It doesn't matter whether you've integrated two or ten standards. I think the principle and the process is the same. It um, doesn't mean to say it's easy. To be fair, you can you absolutely. can have a lot of trouble yeah. integrating two standards. Yeah. It can be relatively easy integrating yeah. five, depending now, on your organisation. <laughs> Here's an interesting one that relates back, sort of builds on the point we've just been making about non-conformances. Now, read it out. It's from Stephen. I have a situation in which a certification body assessor, brackets not NQA, exclamation mark, thank you, has raised a non-conformity against a clause of one standard, say 14,001, but not against the same clause of another certified standard, say 9,001 don't really understand this why would a non-conformance be raised against why would a non-conformance not be raised against both now that's interesting because i think in my mind that depends and without knowing the clause that's quite difficult yeah um if you're raising it against one of the common S, so, so let's say we're raising it let's say it's an integrated system with three standards 9 14 and 18 if I'm raising it to say that the process of uh, internal auditing is unsatisfactory and that not all areas of the system have been covered within the within the internal audit plan, then I think that's a, that's a non-conformance against all three standards. If I raise if if Terry raises a non-conformance against the fact that the health and safety risk assessments haven't been carried out effectively, that would actually be against. Uh, uh clause six point just remind yeah. me Terry, 45 yeah, yeah. But, but, the, but, but, the, but the health but the but the the environmental aspects and impacts evaluation has been done correctly then it would only be raised against the particular relevant 45 clause not against the similar 14 clause if that makes sense i mean some some certification bodies do require um their assessors only to only to use one standard and one clause in a in a finding, and if it's if it's across if it's across multiple findings, some certification bodies would like you to raise uh, numerous no, findings. All oh, right, so if, so if, it, if it's or, if it's across the list, or just make a statement, I've raised it against nine thousand and one, for example. However, uh, and they would request you put a statement in the non-conformity, and this but this is applicable across right. the system. What we would do, I think, is in in our findings table, we would, if it, if it's across three standards, we would we would put the three standards in there. We would put nine thousand and one, fourteen thousand and one, fifty thousand and one. Say clause, whatever. Mm. I wouldn't write the clause number. If it's the same clause, I would just put the three standards in the same clause. I, I think that would be an issue that you you know the, the only way to really bottom that out would be to ask your assessor why they've done it in that way, uh, and, that, and that if if at the opening meeting of the next audit because what you would normally do at, at any opening meeting you go through the the findings that have been raised at the previous audit, my advice there would be to ask them for the rationale, just 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 ask why they've done it in that particular way, right? Um, is there anything else we've missed, Terry? A couple of people talking about an integrated management system is IMS and an integrated management or information management system is INMS, a little bit like an energy management and an EMS. So an EMS is an environmental yeah. management system, ENMS is uh, energy. So that's just a little bit of guidance maybe on, on, on using the, uh, the uh, initials. Uh, we've covered that one. We use the terms OMS um and i think that's about it really i'm just going to say now one last chance for any final questions 
Oh, there's somebody saying hi to me. She used to work with me in one of my previous jobs when I worked for, for a charity. I don't know if he's still with us, Jan, but hi, Jan. Uh, so somebody who used to work with me many, many years ago. Um, right, let's just see. Sorry, I've just moved this. I've just uh, moved the slide there by mistake. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it where it is just at the moment. Um, just talking about um, legislation um, and context. So yeah, I, I, it's something we've covered. It's just build, basically building uh, on, on the things that we've said. So it wasn't really a question. I think that's it, really. Uh, a couple of people talking about specific areas, emergency preparedness response. Yes, that's slightly different. It, it require it relates to requirements for products and services. Will a recording be made available? Yes. Sorry if I missed the answer at the start. Yes, you did. Uh, but yes, it will be. Uh, you will all see a recording. Um, if you raise a non-conformance against one clause of the standard, then the second against the same clause of another standard, will it be counted as two non-conformances? What I would yes, do... Yes, it can be. It can it be. Can <laughs> be it, it can be, and no, it can't be in some cases. That's down to the assessor. Uh, sometimes what I might do is, uh, what I tend to do when I'm doing my audits is I'll raise things as I'm going along and I'll let people know what I'm raising. But towards the end of the audit, when I then say, right, I just need half an hour now to pull everything together, I might decide to group findings together. If there's a common element, I might try and group them together. So there isn't a right and a wrong answer on that. It's down to the individual assessor and whether it's possible to, you know, if there's a particular theme, if there's a particular thread, a trend running across both non-conformances, you might be able to raise it as one. But again, it's difficult to say without without that. Uh, and I think that's it, really. Can you integrate 9,001 and 27,001? Then yes, you can, in answer to that. I've no more questions. Have you, Terry? No, no, that's all. It's, uh, it's well, fine by me. It's, um... we, we, we've lost about a third of our participants, which I don't think is bad, actually. So we've gone over by an hour. We've gone over by 17 minutes. So if there's no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank you on my behalf. Just to remind you, I'm Richard Walsh. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for sitting in on this. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope it's answered the things that you, uh, the questions you might have had. If when this finishes, you think you might have forgotten and you want to answer something, I'm quite happy uh, to um, to give you my contact details. I'm sure Terry wouldn't mind either. Uh, we are both firstname.secondname at nqa.com. I'm richard.walsh at nqa.com. Terry is terry.fisher at, at nqa.com. If you think of something later on, you're laid in bed tonight, you think, oh, why didn't I ask that question? Just bob us an email and we can quite happily deal with it. Somebody's put, always good to hear the opinion of subject experts. There you go, Terry. What can we say? So who, who's entered the room? Anyway. <laughs> I'm going to say, somebody once said to me, never call yourself an expert because an X oh. is a has been and a spurt is a drip. But there you go. There you go. Well, they all Thank you, Mike. The best, Thank you, you Mike. Uh, that's fine. I know Mike. I know Mike well. Thank you very much. So thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope it gave you what you wanted. Uh, if Go back and listen again. It'll all be online. Just to remind you, you will get copies of the presentations and a copy of the recording. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank thanks you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Hope it's been worthwhile. All for the you. best. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. See you again Stay soon. Bye -bye. Cheers. See you later.